Good evening, folks, and welcome to another edition of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. We are retired New York City police detectives and 9-11 World Trade Center first responders. If you like all things true crime related from the police detective's perspective, hit the subscribe button, hit that notification bell so you'll get all things Duty Ron and this guy right here, Ed Wallace, when we go live or upload another video. Hey, I hope everyone had a Merry Christmas and uh, a great uh, calm and peaceful two days. We do New Year, uh, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, and then go right into New Year's. Uh, Ed, how are you doing? How's everything going? And where are you? I'm at an undisclosed location, but I guess you can tell it's a hotel. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yes, I had a great Christmas. And then, uh, you know, Christmas Eve, did the fishes. And oh boy, I got so much fish. And now I'm uh, on, on the road. I left this morning and I'm here now. And uh, I'll be training uh, some people up uh, the next couple of days, next three days. And I'll be back home you jump training on Friday. Yeah, you jump right back in the saddle. You don't even waste any time, Ed. I took the day off, which I don't normally do today, just to sit back and kick back with my son. But today we're going to talk about Chandra uh, Vander Ark. Uh, Sh Shanda uh, is... I would have to say the most hated women, woman in the United States right now, probably the most hated woman in the world because of what she did uh, to her 15-year-old autistic son, special needs, uh, Timothy Ferguson. Um, we covered this case. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of interest in what happens to her next. And we know that on January 29th, Ed, of 2024, will be her sentence and also the son, Paul, they both will be sentenced that day, not in the same courtroom, not at the same time. But this show tonight, we are going to have uh, Anthony Ganji from Tear Talk. He's a corrections executive, an expert, all things correction related. And we want to find out, and I know that most of you in the chat here want to know, what's her day-to-day going to be like uh, behind the wall inside prison? She's not going to be in jail. She's going to be in prison. Uh, and we know the state prison in michigan there's only one that houses women and it holds up to 2060 female inmates that are really bad people and uh huron valley uh correctional uh facility is where she's going to be that's going to be her new that's her 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 lodging is going to be a small room just like timothy had a small room inside a cage a small box that's where she's going to be uh so we're gonna, yeah we're going to jump into that ed and i know you got a lot to say about this well she's truly going to be the jailhouse lawyer yeah and she's got a bunch of clients waiting for her she damn sure does she does she has a lot of people she as they say in the industry it's going to be fresh blood coming into the facility and everybody knows that she's coming in there um but we watched her on the stand, Ed. We watched her on the stand and we saw her um, try to manipulate the jury, try to manipulate the judge, uh, and everybody inside that courtroom with that fake throw up, that that Grammy award winning um, performance inside the courtroom. The crocodile and, vomit. Yeah, yeah, the crocodile vomit. <laughs> we heard that on court TV. I think they said that. That was pretty funny. But crocodile tears, crocodile vomit. Nobody bought into it. Nobody uh, felt that she was truly uh, disgusted by sh the prosecutor showing her her the pictures. But let's take a let's take a peek at that right now because this is going to bring us into our conversation with uh, Anthony. Um, so I want to just take a look at that and s see it again before we proceed. And this is just a couple of minutes. So your testimony is Timothy weighed 104 pounds sometime after May 9th, correct? Yes, sir. That doesn't look anything like 104 pounds, does it? No, sir. And that's not even a month. That's barely a month after May 9th, isn't it? Yes, sir. And he was, by the way, that picture, albeit it's not as horrific as the day he was, uh, that the day he was murdered on July 6th of mm -hmm. 2022, that still was a really a horrible picture from what I read in the local papers. That picture depicted him on his way to that um that very low weight of 69 pounds uh, when uh, he was when he was found in the morning by both Shonda and Paul. 
But yeah, let's just let's just watch the rest of this. this I lose gets, weight very quickly. I'm assuming he got that from me. I lose weight quickly. You stopped them. Yeah, that's what happened. And again, the response to this was give him bread, right? If that's what the text message says, yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Johnson asked you about the uh, some text messages back and forth between you and Paul during the ice bath the last day, the day before Timothy dies. Um, and you were observing that ice bath from work, right? I glanced in on it. I wasn't observing the whole time. I didn't. I couldn't. You weren't observing the entire time? Not the entire time. I glanced in on it. Whenever you'd send a text message, you were also looking at the camera, weren't you? No, I wanted Paul to think I was. And Mr. Johnson asked you if you remember the text about, honestly, tell me if you think this is all fake. Remember that? Vaguely. You vaguely remember that text? Yes, sir. So you can remember the text where it, it, it tries to provide you with a defense to this, but you can't remember any of the horrible things that you did to Timothy. Is that your testimony here today? I don't have any control over what I can remember and what I don't, sir. Oh, yes, you do. You recall Paul's testimony yesterday about what he did in response to that photograph that he sent you and about saying we really need to feed him, Mama? I think we actually need to feed him, I believe, is the actual text. Yes, sir. I remember his testimony. And what was his testimony? That he gave him peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and I guess he cooked him some eggs. That was the first time you heard about that, wasn't it? Yes, sir. And that was not his instructions, was it? No, sir, but that was fine. I had no problem with that. Well, why did you just tell him to make him some eggs in the first place, then? Because I didn't think of it. I was in the middle of something. <laughs> I think we actually need to start feeding him, and the only thing you can come up with, instead of Paul thinking to give him scrambled eggs, is give him some bread. That's all you could think of. It's... I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I was in the middle of something. I wasn't, I wouldn't have thought of eggs anyway, not in the middle of the day. You said that you would, the, the punishments, and I guess this three o'clock in the morning one about not letting him sleep or he gets an ice bath. So he's got to be awake at three o'clock in the morning. You said that was because he would keep you guys up in the middle of the night or wake you up in the middle of the night? Yes. Yes, sir. Can you? Yeah, and again, you did really well on the logic and reason por reasoning portion of the, the LSAT exam. Can you explain the reasoning behind keeping somebody awake when they're keeping you awake? To show them how it feels. But they're already awake, aren't they? It made sense to me, sir. That's Now that you ask it, but it, it doesn't seem to make sense. But it made sense to me at the time. You didn't actually mean that as a punishment. That, that was just out of spite. You were just angry with Timothy for keeping you awake, weren't you? No, it was meant as a punishment, sir. But it's also a punishment for yourself because you have to stay awake as well, don't you? I don't sleep much anyway. But yes, sir. Or Paul has to stay awake, right? Yes, sir. Paul's an insomniac as well. You testified that you gave Paul, you gave Timothy a warm bath the night before he passed away, that last night, July 5th. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. That was the first time you told anybody connected to this case that you'd done that, isn't it? Yes, sir. You never told the police officers you did that, did you? No, sir. <clears throat> I imagine a warm bath sounds just like, it's just what it sounds like, right? You, you got him, you took him to the bath, you grew a warm bath for him, and you put him in the bathtub, right? Yes, sir. This is hours before he dies, right? Yes, sir. You look like that in the bathtub? And the Academy Award goes to. Exactly. I'm sorry. What I liked about this is that nobody went over to console her, or you know, eventually her her defense attorney did. But the reason I played this Ed is because, again, she tried to manipulate the judge, the prosecutor, and the jury. My question is to Anthony when he comes on, will she continue to try to manipulate the correction officers? Will she try to get what she wants from these correction officers by using all of her, all of the things that she has in her tool shed, you know, all of her tools that she has available to her because she thinks that she's really smart, but I'm not quite sure if she's jailhouse smart. So we'll see about that. That's the, that's the classic narcissistic, uh, 
person right there. You know, I'm smarter than everybody. I can get on the stand here and convince everybody, uh, you know, of my innocence and that I'm the victim. No, right. you're not the victim. You're the victimizer. Yeah, correct. Um, so we're going to get into everything uh, as it pertains to um, her care and custody at this Huron. And I'm not sure if I'm, I'm pronouncing it right. So people from Michigan, don't go, don't come and crucify me. Uh, I think it's the Huron Valley Correctional Facility for women. Uh, it's the only facility in the state of Michigan that houses women long term uh, that I know of. And I did some research today, being that I was home, I did some looking into it. Uh, this facility was uh, built in 2006, and it has a long-standing history of complaints of all different kinds of uh, health issues that prisoners that are inside there, from mold to um, uh, you know bacteria-related uh, breathing issues. There's tons and tons of um, lawsuits from not only correction officers, but inmates at this facility has a long history of problems, uh, inhumane conditions, dirty bugs, filthy, all kinds of stuff. And it couldn't, she couldn't be going to a better place <laughs> in my eyes, you know, and, and listen, jail supposed to be a humane place, right? It's not supposed to be a place where you get tortured, but this seems pretty appropriate. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Anthony Ganji. He is the um, founder of Tear Talk. He's an author. He's a corrections expert, and Popeye likes him because he's whistling in the background. Anthony, <laughs> it's a pleasure. You're a fan favorite. Everybody loves you, Anthony. How's it going? How was your Christmas? Uh, it was perfect. You know, as I told you, my, my girls got what they wanted, you know, which is what matters the most. I have a, uh, will be a seven year old uh, January 3rd, and then I have my older who's 11 so it's me and sienna but yes christmas was beautiful and it's good to spend part of the holiday with you two lovely young fellas in the audience thank you thank you thank and you. for the new subscribers and we have quite a few new subscribers would you care to just give them some of your background as it pertains to the correction field uh yeah so i have over uh about 21 years in I started as an officer at a female facility. I was an officer there for about nine years. So I'm very familiar with working at a female facility. That's the only one the state has, because uh, I was also in the same circumstance. Uh, then I moved up uh, to the rank of sergeant, uh, went to a male facility. And then for the last eight or nine years, I, I'm in prison management. So I've been through, I worked at uh, five different uh, prisons, uh, all levels of custody, uh, different types of treatment. I've worked with both male and female offenders. Uh, and uh, I've been transferred six different times, so five facilities, six times across the state of New Jersey. Now I oversee the employee morale, and then I I bought the I this, I did the YouTube channel Tear Talk because I think people uh, need the truth about what happens behind the wall. So my effort uh, to the channel there is not only to help staff, uh, but to give staff's perspective on things because it's not always what people may believe. I'm not here to sell anything related to politics. I'm just here to tell you what my thoughts are. And in the process, I get to come on duty Ron's channel and just, you know, shoot the breeze with some real good people. Yeah. And everybody loves yeah. your insight. You know, Ed and I, when we talk about experts and we're, we delve into topics like this, it's not our expert uh, expertise. So we like to reach out to folks like yourself. This is not what we do. Um, you know, so when it comes to having a conversation and discussing about, what's happening day to day to some of these inmates and some of these cases that we talk about, we all, you're our go-to uh, guys. So I'm, I'm, you know, just telling everybody that's in the chat, everybody that watches this replay, uh, tier talk is, is the place to get your information. Um, I wanted to play a quick clip and this is from only a year ago. Uh, and it, this is going to talk about a little bit of the um, issues inside this facility. And I wanted to just get that out of the way. And then we're going to go straight from there, Anthony. And I want you to walk us through the process for uh, uh, Vander Ark when she gets sent straight to this facility. And I'm not sure if she's there yet because I tried mm -hmm. to search for her and it didn't show up. Uh, but we know that she's going there because there's no other place for her to go. So this is going to be the facility she goes to. So I want you to, when we come back, walk us through the intake process. What do they do with her on day one? Is she placed on suicide uh, watch? And all of these things, we won't get into it right now. 
But folks, hang on, and we'll get right into it when we come back. This is just from a year ago, so let's take a listen to this. Some problems inside the facility where she's going to be staying for the rest of her life. Some unsettling and disturbing allegations have come to light. A number of people gathered outside the Women's Huron Valley Correctional Facility to support two former employees alleging inmates there have been sexually abused. And the two whistleblowers were fired, allegedly, for saying so. Ethically, morally, and legally, I am responsible. I cannot turn my head when it comes to injustices that are being done. If I see someone, something, someone that's helpless, that is being picked on, berated, if I turn my head, I am no better than the person who is doing the abusing. That is one of two women whose attorney claims she and another former worker at the Women's Huron Valley Correctional Facility spoke up about inmates there being sexually assaulted, allegedly. The women claim they were then fired because of it. Here's the second anonymous woman describing an alleged encounter with an inmate. She was just able to have sex with one of the uh, groundskeepers. Their offices were completely ravaged and they were told they would let go. So I'm here because they came forward. They said, no, we're human. We can't allow this to happen. It shouldn't be happening to them. Just because they're inmates does not mean they don't get treated with dignity or respect. Dion Webster Cox is now representing the two women and claims there are other problems at the facility, including drugs allegedly being distributed to inmates who are combating opioid addictions and a lack of adequate medical care for seriously ill prisoners. I didn't know the orange is the new black and Wentworth were going on in Michigan. I didn't know, I thought these were just television programs. We, we know this has happened in the past, but I know in Michigan back in 2009, millions of dollars have been paid out to address these allegations. They're still going, somebody didn't get the memo that this behavior is not acceptable. We showed up! A group came together Sunday outside of the prison to stand with the women and express their disgust with the allegations. One of the organizers put it this way. We're just here to raise our voices, to offer support, and to put those that the powers that be on notice that we will not tolerate this injustice of these women. We will continue to stand until we see change. So I just wanted to play that because I wanted to show that there's a long-standing history and not just this stuff, but this was just a year ago there was correction officers who were forced to work extra overtime and they put multi-million dollar lawsuits against this facility. There was the lawsuit for um, the black mold that was growing above their uh, showers uh, and they won these lawsuits. And so what the attorney there was saying is, we thought we got this corrected back in the day, but it seems to be still going on. So my point here is, is and I'm not saying this to make an argument about this, is in my book, it's just very ironic that such a piece of is now, yeah. I know, I know, I just unmuted it, is now going over to this hellhole. And it seems like this place is not, from my view of what I'm looking at, they got problems. There's problems here and this facility is, um, you know, ha having issues and she's going to be, um, she's going to be a guest there. So Anthony, I wanted you to jump in uh, with your take, the intake process. What happens to her when she starts going in there? Is a welcome wagon waiting for her? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, just walk the audience through what goes on with a brand new inmate that has two life sentences. Yeah. So, so just, just to backtrack real quick, you know, all facilities are going to have problems, but it's a matter of, who the media chooses at that point to exploit because every facility is going to have definitely maintenance concerns 100%. And maybe later on, if we get a chance, we could explore some of the changes that have been done in female facilities to include uh, limited interactions with male, male staff on less emerging conditions. Uh, okay. So and that's part of the questions I want to ask you is about that, about how that goes at an all female facility. But yeah, yeah, 100%. We could discuss that. Uh, I was there actually later on. We could talk. I was there when those changes evolved. I was there when when Priya started to take place, which is the Prison uh, Prison okay. Rape Elimination Act, which actually started the changes. But uh, so it, if she gets sentenced, it, it really does depend on how fast the state picks her up. So once you get sentenced, you know, okay, reality kicks in. This is the time that you have to do. So because she's looking at two life sentences. 
100%, she's got to be put on some constant watch and be observed by mental health. Now, if she doesn't go right to a state facility, the jail may do it until the state picks her up. But if she's picked up right after that and goes into a state facility, uh, she will go ahead and definitely, I would definitely put her on a watch, have mental health talk to her to make sure she's adjusted to uh, the consequences of her actions. Now, being that it's the only female facility out of the 30, I think it was like 31 that uh, Michigan has, uh, they are going to be self um reliant uh, they're, 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 all their needs are going to be done within that facility so they will have what they would call a central reception area which means that when the inmates come from county they go to a central reception area and then the decisions made as to which facility that that individual will go to so if it was a male facility uh there are facilities that are dedicated to central reception and then they do the assignments across the state as to where that inmate will be assigned but if you got someone that's doing double life sentence and they're on the higher end, they may wave right through the class, uh, the uh, central reception process, and maybe put her right through into a housing unit that's already been prepared uh, for her to enter. Because I've seen that. I've seen that with men as well who have a very high profile case and they don't send them to centralized reception. They already know right off the bat that this person, there's no other facility they're going to go to. They're going to go to this max facility. So that's where this person uh, will wind up going. So at first she's going to go to a, a central reception, uh, but I think they're going to waive that. She'll be seen by medical and mental health, but most likely the records from county will carry over. So they'll have a good uh, understanding of uh, where she stands mentally. So her wellness as well as her, as her physical health. Um, but, uh, but other than that, I, I don't see too much of a difference in how she would be handled next to how other females would be handled coming into the system, except for they may speed her through the reception process. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so my thing is, is this is, you know, so she is now looking at not ever having a chance to see the light of day. Uh, and a lot of our chatters and a lot of our people who send in questions and, and, and dutyrun.com happens to be down right now. We're doing, trying to do some maintenance and getting it switched over. But a lot of the questions that we saw during his, tri during his trial, while dutyrun.com was still up, was the questions about when she finally goes in, will she be in protective custody? Will the Department of Corrections, and we know from listening to you and Ed and I, we talk about this all the time, their their primary goal was to, to keep the inmates that they have inside their facilities alive, right? Um, they don't want to uh, risk having that type of um, negative attention, so to speak, on their hands. But we know it happens. Um, you know, look at Jeffrey Epstein, right? Uh, but the bottom line is, is that th that's, a, that's a big sticking point. A lot of people want to know, like, is she going to now be put in protective custody? Are these female inmates going to be wanting to come at her um you know how does that go you said you worked in a in a female yeah. facility yeah so this is a a very unique situation because dialogues in the past when it comes to dealing with men uh sometimes if you have a case that's got a lot of fame connected to it especially a case related to children uh there is a generalized assumption that uh, those inmates tend to be considered targets. And the generalized assumption comes because there's a high probability that they will be assaulted. Uh, and that has happened in the past, whether the males choose to connect to the fame or whether, uh, you know, hey, it's an attack on children. You know, we don't tolerate that here. So out of the goodness of my heart, I'm going to go ahead and beat the hell out of this guy. Uh, but it, it's not something that you may see the females do all the time. So it, it's not a probability. It's more like a likelihood. And therefore, I don't know if PC would be uh, definitely warranted at the very beginning, unless there was a specific threat that could be identified and not just a generalized assumption. Like when I, when we talked about the dialogue in the past, remember, it wasn't necessarily someone being specifically threatened, but the generalized assumption that when someone does this type of crime, most likely there's a level of retaliation uh, within the male facilities. That's even why male facilities may even have dedicated units or dedicated facilities to PC, protective custody. But I, I, in my experience, and guys, nothing's ever 
but I'm going to weigh on what's probable versus what's likely. My decisions really are based on the probability of something happening and not on the likelihood of something happening. And there is a difference. Probability is is, is weighed more. Uh, but granted, nothing's 100% and, and stuff could happen. Um, but I would not automatically believe that she would warrant protective custody because don't forget, there's going to be also other females that will relate to that type of crime because maybe they've committed a crime like that before. Right. Or or I, I like to also say in the female facility, it's a little bit different too in, in how, they, how they maneuver. A lot of female inmates are very family bound and they, they show support to each other regardless of what they've done. So, you, you know, you could have someone who's committed a crime like this and then they go in and they, you know, they may play a victim route and like like this this female could. And don't forget, it's not about manipulating officers. She can manipulate her peers, other inmates, and she could play a victim route. And all of a sudden she gets support behind the wall by other offenders who, you know, want to help her get through this because there's that maternal instinct that could be behind the wall from these offenders. So I don't I don't think PC is going to be an automatic in this case. I think they're going to allow her to go into GP. Interesting. Interesting, Ed. Uh, what did you? Th- what do you think about that? Well, to be quite honest with you, uh, I think she should be in general pop. Yeah. Right. I. I. She. She's shown no necessity for uh, protective custody. Right. I. I. I don't think. Uh, I think uh, to be quite honest with you, I think she would. Uh, do quite well in gen pop maybe maybe uh putting her in isolation uh would actually um be more harmful uh to her yeah i mean i don't know because for, for me each of these facilities i guess could be run differently but this one seems to have uh, quite a bit uh, quite a bit of population there's freaking 2000 women in this facility right now that's Can right. I add? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I apologize. Yeah. No, no, no. I go want, ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to add, Ed. Uh, obviously, hundred percent agreement with you. I just want mm-hmm. to add something to that, just to complement your thought, by the way, because it's spot on. So these facilities, when when you're the only facility that houses female, I, I mentioned you're going to be self-sustaining, which means that you can't rely on the resources of other facilities. If I have a concern, I can't just transfer them out. So this facility, I believe, is very spread out and and has a way where. Uh, the layout of the facility is able to manage uh, threats. I mean, you know, granted, um, if it's an individualized concern, you could still put a keep separate between her and that individual and make sure that they don't kind of connect on any centralized function like a chapel. I don't know if they do centralized feeding or if it's fed fed in the cell. Uh, But either way, I I think that these facilities, uh, if, if there is a need for PC, it's not like, and I, I this is where I'd be what very is, interested. What does PC mean, Anthony? Oh, pr- protective, custody. protective custody. Sorry about that. Yeah. So the practices that I'm more familiar with, especially because I've worked in a state where you only have one female facility, is that PCs, uh, there's not a lot of inmates that meet the criteria of PC, believe it or not. Uh, you're talking about thousands across the state that maybe only – uh, 80 or 90 may qualify for, I mean, really officially qualify for, remember, because that's a process that's got to be screened because you got to protect the inmates that are in PC. You just can't let anybody who claims PC. And and, and he said, Ed said something that really uh, hit, hit, hit home is that basically there's got to be a specific concern. You know, you're not just going in PC to go in PC. You, what's the specific threat? When did it happen? What was said? And I think that will be played out more here because the generalized assumption would be that women don't retaliate against these type of crimes or it's not known for them to retaliate against these type of crimes. Again, anything can happen, but for the most part, the the, the probability is low. So with, with that said, an agreement would add, yeah, and, and if they did have a PC unit and this, 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 this would... I don't think it would be literally a PC unit. I think how they would do the PC unit, it, it was it would be uh, located in one of the areas that are the most restrictive in which they have to allow her the privileges, which makes it harder for us to operate because I'll, I'll try to put this simple because uh, but but I know what I'm trying to say here is that usually when you don't have a dedicated PC unit, it, because it does require the highest level of custody, you're going to have to allow that inmate probably into the highest level of custody Right. But then you have to give them the most amount of privileges because they're not there for punitive reasons. They're there for PC reasons. And it becomes complicated because I can't manage both 
the highly res the restrictive inmates alongside this one person from PC. So my objective, if I was jail uh, prison management here, is that I would look to place her in GP unless there was a specific threat that really applied to the facility as a whole. And even if that did happen, last resort, I, I would look to transfer out of a, out of state. But it's very extreme. So I, I think GP yeah. is, is where she's going. I I, th I agree. I believe that's where she will go. But now I wanted to ask you because you made one quick you made one quick point before you went to that she would not be into GP. There would be um, one small issue. And that issue that you mentioned was if there was some type of chatter of uh, a threat against her. Now, I wanted, I saw some people in the chat when you said that, we were asking questions and the chat goes so fast, but I just thought of it again. Does this mean that there's some type of intel that is coming from the correction officers, the, the staff that might hear some chatter like, hey, when this Vander Ark girl gets in here, I'm going to shank her. I'm not saying that that's what they're saying, right. but is it is is that what you were alluding to? Is that if somebody from your staff as executive management now gets a hold of hearing some inmates talk, or well, I'm going to F this girl up when she gets in here, that type of stuff, would that be reason to put her in that protective custody uh, situation? Well, yeah, I, I mean, if the threat is more generalized, where it makes it harder for the facility to manage, especially a facility like this, where you only have one facility that houses females. So if it's a specific threat, you can hold them responsible. Like it, when, before you have a female like this that comes in, I'm sure you have investigative agencies there and custody and you got the inmate pipeline, but they can also screen phone calls uh, to some extent, check letters or check mail. Uh, so, you know, or, or just maybe that people that are volunteering information. Hey, again, if she comes here, you know, we're not going to have it here. But again, I, for, for this type of facility, because it's the only one that houses females, it, it would have to be a general. I know this may sound weird because I'm, I'm saying specifically general. But what I mean by that is it would be outside of like an individual effort to do something. It would be more of something where say, hey, yo, if she comes here, we have problems in every unit, wherever this person could be possibly housed, which I, I don't think is going to be very prop or likely uh amongst the female population so i i find that you know you may even if there's one or two i don't think it would be enough to justify uh protective custody i think that you'd be able to handle the one or two if there is any and right. then still place her safely i want to take a look at the overview shot um uh, like an overhead shot of this facility um it's in ypsilanti michigan um, so let's just take a look and see how large it is from the satellite view here. Uh, it looks pretty big. Um, the, the, here's the whole outline of the place. Um, quite a, Anthony, did you ever see this picture of this place? No, but, but, but I think if I'm, no, this is my first time seeing it, but I'm thinking like this. So obviously it's a big facility because it's going to house all levels of custody. So what we mean by that, guys, is those that are full minimum, which would be inmates that are uh, the least restrictive, they have the most privileges, up until the highest level, which would be those that are most restrictive, which would be the highest level of custody. And I, I believe uh, Duty Ron had mentioned they have a number system, one being the lowest and then highest four or five. And, and I don't know if it goes up to six, but it goes up, so to, five. It goes up to five. Right. So basically, I, I think that the side of the compound that you're looking at right now, as opposed to the other side, you go to the other side, uh, yeah, the lower side, you're going to want to look for where it's more spread out. I would probably guess that the other side, the side you're looking at now, maybe for lower level and the side to the right, uh, maybe for the higher level statuses, but that's just, uh, you don't yeah, see, this, you don't see, this, field. you don't, yeah, you don't see baseball fields too often. This one doesn't look like it's well kept, but here's the tennis, tennis, courts. Court, tennis courts, baseball field, Ed. Is this a country club? Yeah, that's the lower level there. That's what yeah, I let's thought. Go, yeah, to, go to the right. Go to the right. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There's Rawway. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, I used to work there. So, uh, so as you can see, guys, when it comes to the uh, that level, uh, the higher level, obviously things are going to be more uh, uh, confined, yeah. sort of. But if you notice, each one of those units possibly – should yes. be separated from dealing with the other units unless there's a centralized function that brings them together. But uh, for the most case here, you you have what looks like uh, that side of the compound is the, probably the most restrictive where she where she would probably go based on her time. Now, granted, 
Uh, is she a threat? Uh, we don't know. I mean, you really don't know. But her time itself is going to give her maximum uh, security for the time being. Yeah, this is all completely closed off from the rest. Yeah, of it. I, that's definitely the max. Yeah. I, I believe that would be the max. Side. Yeah, you can see the fence goes all the way around here. Every yeah. time I look at this, I could see a picture of her in Gen Pop with like a little <laughs> uh, Lucy um, Lucy uh, Stan from the Peanuts. You know, like yeah, Lucy yeah. and Charlie Brown. Lemonade, like was, lemonade. Yeah, well, no lemonade. She was doing the psych psychological exams, but I can see her setting up a little lawyer box and having all these. Uh, inmates come up to her and asking her legal advice and suing the uh, Department of Corrections or or filing appeals and, and doing all kinds of crap for them. Well, you know, you, you know, you're, you're spot on, X. I know we were talking about before we come in, but now I will say one thing. Uh, she's definitely going to be an asset to the many people uh, behind the wall. But I, I will say one thing, though, here. Uh, there's a difference, and, and you guys mentioned this before, so I'm kind of just connecting to your thought before, was there's a difference between a regular lawyer and a jailhouse lawyer. You know, right. these jailhouse no lawyers know how to maneuver around the system. So most of the time, yeah, you may have lawyers that uh, help someone with their outside cases, but we have the paralegals inside that help the inmate with the charges that they catch in the system. And uh, to be honest with you, I mean, yeah, it's good to have that legal experience but uh jailhouse lawyers they know their stuff because they lived it they've been through it mm -hmm. yeah yeah and you know it's funny you mentioned the jailhouse lawyer thing that was my next uh question um you know it, it, women we already covered uh women when it comes to these heinous crimes where other women kill children it's not the same as men they kind of accept them in it's almost like a nurturing thing um, but if they do come off as cocky and not conform to kind of what's happening around them, if she goes in there with that attitude, that might be a problem for her. But the jailhouse justice, um, as we would hope would happen with her, is probably not on the on the on the table here um, for her because of the way these the way the way these women's women facilities run. Now the suicide watch. Do they automatically do that for a period of time just to evaluate her where we see that turtle suit or whatever, however you want it, whatever the politically correct way is? I'm not politically correct. Well, so. it's not, it's, it's not, no, no, it's right. It's not always. So sometimes it, it may not always uh, go to that level of a constant watch, but still you may be observed constantly. So I know you mentioned a turtle suit. So usually if you feel the person, um, is willing to commit to, we, we say self-injurious behavior. We don't say suicide because the only person that could say suicide at the end, at the end of the day is a doctor. So when we see someone that's probably looking to hurt themselves, we'll use the word like self-injurious, but now granted, there may be the policy that says, Hey, she just got sentenced like this. You got to put her on a 72 hour watch, but then you may have mental health that may say, yeah, but you know what? You don't got to take everything from her. Because being that she's on a watch, she really never made any direct threat to hurt herself. But we'll just go through it because that's what policy says. So mental health will make a determination of whether she's allowed to have things in her cell or not, depending on how, how they feel uh, she's going to act out on whatever the threat is. But there are some times where you could have people that come in and you're just like, hey, this person's very upset. They're depressed. They they you know they lived a high life. Now they're on a low life. We have a feeling they're going to kill themselves put them in a turtle suit, strip them from everything, and put them on a constant watch for 72 hours to eliminate the impulse. But mind you, when you do that, that's not an easy decision because I know people on the outside looking in, but just bear with me on this perspective, their rights. And you got to be very wary when those decisions are made because you got to be able to justify the fact that this person uh, you felt at the time was immediately a risk for self-injurious behavior. And it goes more than just, well, they got sentenced to double life sentence. Okay, well, what did mental health say when they spoke to him? She didn't say she was going to carry anything out. She's, you know, been used to it because she was in the jail for so long. So all right. because you're on a constant watch doesn't mean that you're automatically stripped of everything. It, it depends on what mental health feels uh, uh, if you oppose immediate threat to yourself or not. Right. It's all based on the interview. What, what, uh, yeah, on, on, the, on the psych evaluation. Yes, sir. So our friend here, uh, MJ Maxi, uh, who's a channel member, she said, what is, what is turtle soup? What the hell? Uh, no, it's, a, soup. it's a suit. It's so it's like it almost looks like a vest, a bulletproof vest, but it's obviously not. And it um, it's Velcro and it could rip apart and you can't use it to 
um, hang yourself in, in the facility. Um, but but again, it does taste like chicken. There you no. go. It tastes like chicken. <laughs> um, so, you know, when we look at some of the testimony that she gave, and, and, and I, I don't know what, and this brings me to my next questions of what I want to ask you, Anthony, is I don't know what inmates are allowed to see when they get those tablets or they get those communication devices. Um, do will the will the inmates in that facility have been able to see news, local news reports, because that trial was covered uh, yeah. not only nationwide, but it was covered worldwide. So uh, can they see live local news on their in their rec uh, places, rec center, or wherever, right. whatever it's called? And do they know that she force fed um, this kid uh, hot sauce to to the the heat of that grown men couldn't ingest the stuff like the right? So 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 the the unique thing about this is uh, you can't deny inmate access technically to. Uh, Current events, sort of, right? But by the way, inmate pipeline's big. You have 2,100 inmates, let's say. I think this facility now has like six or seven, whatever, 700, whatever. Right. There's always going to be someone that they're talking to on the outside that says, hey, look, you know who you're getting? You're probably getting this one soon, and this is what she's done. And so, I mean, you can't control every angle where they can get information from. But with that said, you can minimize maybe. So inmates do have access to their own TV. So if I'm walking by their cell and I peek in and they're watching the event on the news and it's through the legal cable channels that they get. Uh, I, I, there's not really much I could do at that point, but if it's in a public rec room uh, where everybody could see it, I'm probably not going to want to play that because I think that puts more of a, a liability on us. So I wouldn't play it in the rec room uh, where there's many people watching it, but I would probably have very limited control of what they decide to watch on their own. And again, this is what makes it tough. Right. Uh, and I know we talked about men before, but kind of like running parallel with that is that you never know when a hot story is going to pop up or you never know when something gets revisited 10 years from now when all of a sudden an old topic becomes hot again. So can they search uh, and they search randomly on the Internet with these tablets that they have. Can are they limited in what they can see the inmates there? And I'm, my 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 direct question is, is once this Vander Ark gets into the facility, is she going to be able to see what's going on in the outside world or what people are doing to talk to talk about her or talk with her uh, to grant or to turn down interview requests? Like, how does that work? Right. So the tablet, for your first question, the tablet should not have internet access, but that doesn't mean you don't have inventive inmates or innovate that can find a way to get internet access. Mm -hmm. um, they do have access to probably emails, but those emails are screened through a centralized review committee uh, and they look for target words. So, I mean, you're not, you know, basically if there's certain keywords that come up or use frequently, uh, it flags it. And then there's a, probably a centralized review team that's able to look up to see specifically what was said and why the why it was flagged, but they wouldn't have direct access to that. But there are to internet. Uh, yeah. But there are inmates that are able to get magazines. They are able to get, um, um, you know, newspapers. Now I will say this, and I have seen this done in the past, but it really does depend on the facility. If she was the cover of a newspaper, I wouldn't allow it in because yeah. I can't. I can't deny the fact that. I saw that and it still made it in because now the liability comes on us because there's no way we could deny seeing that. I'm being honest with you. I mean, it's all about plausible deniability, right? Yeah. So if she's it, it, all of a sudden people magazine decides to make this, this lady woman of the year eh, joke, but just saying, and she becomes on the cover oh, of the, wait, uh, wait a minute. Hold no, on. I, I, oh, yeah, hell no. Yeah. I was waiting for something, but, yeah. but what I meant by that in comparison is, is that, there's no way denying that when that magazine came in, uh, there she was on the cover and then you just handed it out. And so people always try to connect A to B if something happens. But uh, you're, you're, you really cannot deny them access to current events. So if someone's watching Absolutely. it in their that room. Blows mind. Mind. It blows my mind. It blows my mind. Every time we no, talk. No, it's a great it, question. It makes me, it makes my, my head explode. So here in the chat, I got to ask everybody, if you think that it's okay for an inmate in the capacity, you know, to the extent of what she did to her own flesh and blood should have the right to have. And, and again, this falls under, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that these are your rules, Anthony, but these are rules of 
folks that are incarcerated, right? It's supposed to be. Uh, well, female huge, female yeah. offenders are actually protected a lot more than. I mean, granted, it's different now. Uh, ACLU is very involved, pretty much, with the criminal justice system. But believe it or not, a lot of female offenders are seen as victims first before they're fin- offenders. So there'll be someone probably looking into her backstory, trying to already give her ways to validate. Mm-hmm. Uh, what she did by looking at her history, because that's just yeah. how the world's been twisted now. It's un- it's unfortunate, but there's no excuse for what she did, right. obviously. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it, I would have to, if I was a betting man, I would have to say that she was abused as a child as well, or the potentiality for her as a young adult, or in some po- some form, uh, some way, shape, or form in, in, in her life. But here's the thing, is what I was trying to get at is, I was trying to pool the chat. If you guys feel that it's... Um, uh, that it should be uh, an inmate's right to be able to have access to the outside world, the internet and so forth. Like the way I saw it um, and, and the way I continue to see it is you get, you get incarcerated, you get your visitors, you get to make your phone call. I know they don't want you waiting on that line anymore. So they let you make these calls through these tablets or whatever they do. But the thing of it is, is I, I, I want to just see what people think. Do you think that it, that inmates should have these, um, communication devices and access to the outside world press a one if you do say no press a two i see on tiktok and on all these social medias in especially in the mail facilities i see them going live like what what is that How, right so that happen so so obviously so let, let's just let's just i want to mention something here guys because uh couple things. So obviously the show, there, there is a level of monitored access. So I, I agree. They should not have cell phones. They should not be recording video. A hundred percent. I mean, uh, I've done shows on the news about that. It's unacceptable. And obviously there's, uh, unfortunately there's probably some corruption that brings that stuff in. I mean, I'm not going to deny that we're not a perfect system, but I will say one thing though, guys, it, um, uh, from just the perspective side of managing individuals at this level, I know this may sound crazy, but the way we work in a prison and jail setting is we manage the population through a loss first gain system, which means if they have nothing to lose, we have no way to control their behavior. So there's got to be some level of uh, this is generalized, but hear me out. Got to be some level of hope because so whether that's hope of getting a phone back or hope of getting the tablet back. I mean, things that they're allowed to have because if not to get them to conform. Yeah, you, you got it. It's a carrot because the system right now has proven that rewards don't work. You can't reward an inmate and then expect them to be totally compliant. It doesn't work that way. People are really motivated more by a loss than a gain because they have a lifestyle they've been accustomed to. And when you take it away, it breaks away from the routine or consistent pattern of what they're used to. Like I like to watch TV. I like to watch sports every Sunday, but now I messed up and Ganji took my TV. So I get some people may think it's quick to, you know, you know, put her in this and take away all these privileges, but then it, it makes it pretty difficult for staff to manage an individual when there is no um, uh, future hope. And when I mean hope, I mean within the parameters of what she's allowed to, to have. I, I, I want to know sense. what Ed Wallace thinks of this. <laughs> be fair, Ed. Be fair. <laughs> it is always fair and just. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying. Oh, don't do the crime if you can't do the time. There it okay. is. There you go. Simple. Right. There it is. Simple and straight to the point. Yeah. You, you, know, you, you know, you did the you did the crime and there's consequences, right? That's what we have to teach. You have to take responsibility for your actions. And she definitely doesn't take responsibility. She's trying to portray herself as the victim. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, now she's going to get into uh, the prison system and she's going to realize that all those freedoms that she once had, all those little things that she took for granted are mm-hmm. gone. Yeah. Okay. And she's got to deal with the system and live with the new surroundings and the new rules that she brought upon herself. She has to now go to her small little box, her small little room, whatever, you know, the same type of situation, which she put Timothy through her, her son. She's going to be in that small, small cell. And I don't know, I've seen pictures of open, you know, regular old style cells and then I've seen the ones with the doors. And I, I think the yeah. doors are in the mental health um, spots uh, where it's closed up, where, you, you know, there's no uh, interaction. There's nothing where you can you know, hang through a, a pair of bars. I think that she, you know, made her bed and she's going to now have everything. Everything that she does is going to be, she's going to be told what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And that, to me, is what uh, prison is supposed to be. 
Well, her I, new I, digs. I, I mean, okay. Her Go new ahead. digs are going to be just about the same size as the closet that she put her poor son room. Timothy in. Closet, yeah, the room. I'll and, make I'll make you guys a bet right now. I bet you within less than six months, and I, I'm probably being gracious on this. She finds herself a girlfriend in there. Oh my! Uh, I Who I wants think, to bet me. I well, you're probably right, but I think she'll start <laughs> initiating. I think she'll start initiating lawsuits. Okay, uh, and here's another thing. Hey, do that, Anthony. Do they have hot sauce in the in the cafeteria? In a mess well, hall? They, 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 well, it depends. Uh, some of them can buy it from commissary. I don't know if it's something that uh, is actually served to everyone in the general population, but they definitely it's available in, in commissary probably for some places. Okay, and where would they keep that in their cell and then bring it to the cafeteria when they want to utilize it? Is well, it? They, well, I don't. It depends on what the rules are of the facility. Usually, it's for the stuff that they buy on commissary. I know where Ed's going with this. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know because the, the 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 child right was force fed hot 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 sauce. Really, yeah. really, really hot hot sauce. The worst that you can get your hands on. And 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 I'm gonna play right now what the lieutenant um, here in court read the label of this hot sauce and ed you know again this is what makes her crime so so evil so demonic so horrific is that she fed Read this to her kid the jury the label there for <clears throat> that hot sauce <clears throat> elijah's extreme extreme regret is screaming super hot it packs the fire of the two hottest peppers in the world the trinidad scorpion and Carolina Reaper peppers. Your tongue will burn from the sting of the scorpion. Your eyes will tear up as sweat pours off your head. Your throat Jeez. feels the burn of the Carolina Reaper going down. The pain becomes unbearable and you feel like you just ate a burning hot coal. Burning hot That's coal. when you realize extreme regret, not for wimpy hot soft lovers, use with caution or you'll regret it. Mm. So that's what she had her son, Paul, who was 19 at the time, and by his own admission, uh, you know, is, is not right himself, um, feed to him on bread. Well, they Google, they Google searched for that particular hot sauce. They wanted the hottest hot sauce out there, okay? And it's $30 a bottle it's nice. right, to, to torture this kid. Timmy, uh, this is ridiculous. What about, There's your uh, premeditated, premeditated, yeah, right? Absolutely. And and what about the um the showers there? Okay, any ice baths around? Mm, yeah. Yeah, we had, sometimes our water doesn't produce heat sometimes. So yeah, definitely I won't she makes that complaint. She needs to live in that one. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, we definitely have cold showers sometimes. I'm gonna I did I did this the last um the last live stream as well because I want to give people that, that haven't seen this uh, a chance to see this. Here's two grown men. Again, I'm only going to play a minute of this. But they put a dab of this on, this guy right here. And the other one puts a full teaspoon and, and ingests it. Let me eat this piece of chocolate. I just had a gigantic smoothie right before this. I'm trying to coat my stomach because I got cramps off the regular one. A little dab. Oh, I'm done. You're smart, man. It's on my channel. Whew! Ah, that's foolish. It is very smooth for having the top three ingredients as peppers. It is smooth. Yeah, it's it's very it's very clean for having that much for se being seventy percent peppers. It smells so. I like, just think in what seventy percent of that is peppers. It smells so angry. So like over to here, oh, all that's peppers. Oh, I know, man. <laughs> Dude, there's like separation happening in it from just sitting in the spoon of just like pepper oils. I do this for you. I love you guys. Cheers. <laughs> oh my yeah. God. Yeah, come on. Yep. It tastes good. Oh, I just swallowed again. Ah, oh, man. Holy crap. They were feeding this to this kid for months. Yeah. I'm not even going to play the rest of it. But you guys know, you could look at some of my other videos. You could go back and see the whole thing. I have it linked in the description. Um, horrific. Just, uh, she is a demonic 
devil. This is like the worst of the worst. So where she's going, I don't care. And the reason I played in the beginning of this thing that there was uh, inmates in the past suing that facility for all kinds of different health issues with mold coming out of the ceiling, coming out of the floor, um, being hospitalized, not being treated the right way, um, you know, medically for it. I, I mean, I, I don't even want to say I hope this place is still the same way. I know that they make these corrections once this is brought to light. This was back in the day. But right up until last year, there was these complaints of the things that are happening there. And, um, you know, no facility, as you said, these are huge, huge facilities. And they're not without people who are in there doing things that they're not supposed to do. Um, I wanted to go to this last question that I had from, uh, we covered all, everything that I wrote down here, but Michelle um, McCarthy uh, asked, and she, this was for me and Ed, uh, was DCFS involved before the death of Timothy? And I come to find out in my readings today that there was no open case on her, but from back in Oklahoma, where she was from, they said that they were going to take her parental rights away from her unless she moved away. They gave her an option to keep her parental rights and move away from these kids and never have any contact with them. Hence, she moved to Michigan, but she moved to 18 different uh, addresses before she landed in um, in Michigan. So she, she went to 18 different um, apartments or whatever places where she was living before she wound up over in uh, her her place of, of where she was li- residing while this crime, this horrific crime, was taking place. But during so, the trial, didn't the ju- didn't there was a there was a moment in time where um, during her testimony, uh, they were getting into that, and I believe there was a judge's order from Oklahoma that took away her parental rights. I have it right here. <clears throat> so I'm going to put it up on the screen. That's because she was not supposed to have Timothy. It says, uh, 15-year-old Timothy Ferguson was tortured and starved to death by his mother. Uh, Timothy was homeschooled. His seven-year-old brother also lived in the home but was not reported abused. Timothy was homeschooled because of his disabilities. He was autistic and had speech and motor impairments. In 2012, Vanna Ark was the subject of a previously substantiated child abuse investigation in Oklahoma, but evaded having her parental rights terminated by agreeing to vacate the family home. She had 18 different addresses spanning multiple states before moving to the Norton Shores in 2021, where she passed the bar and worked as a legal clerk. Timothy and his father apparently moved to Norton Shores in May of 2021, uh, but he he suffered a stroke. Let me see. Wait, hold on. Van der Ock began um, abusing Timothy shortly after the stroke, as we know, and we heard that in court. Um, Van der Ock began to abuse Timothy uh, and ordered Paul to participate in the abuse. Timothy was forced to sleep on a tarp in a closet, which was locked with an alarm at night, so Timothy had no access to the bathroom, blah, 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 blah. But there's the what I read. Yeah, I remember during the trial, um, the, the prosecutor uh, she was cross, being cross examination uh, during cross examination. The prosecutor had an issue with her in the way she interpreted a judge's ruling about her her right. uh, custody of Timothy. Yeah, the, in this article, it was this article. I just went to see the date was July sixth of twenty twenty two. So they got that part wrong about the father. It wasn't his biological father that had the stroke. It was the um, it was the stepdad her second husband who had the stroke. But he was the one, I think, that was keeping everything level, and it seemed like everything shit the bed once he had his stroke, and she started to be able to do his thing. But you're right. You're right. I mean, I heard that, too, in the court. But again, I was reading this from... Um, this was from a local local paper, and, and um, the, you know, people who are local really try to dive into these cases a little bit more than the mainstream media. So that was a, an article that I dug up. Uh, right. Was- and as you and I both said in the, in the previous episodes, I'm, I'm shocked, I'm shocked that the biological father of Timothy has not been charged with any crimes. And it's 17 months later, there's no crime. There's nothing, nothing charged to him. He was in court. They said he came and brought Timothy and said that he was going to either bring him to child welfare or she to take him which 
in in my eyes is that's illegal. He knew that. Well, she he didn't. He didn't go to court with that. He called her up and he said, "This is up. this is the options. I can't deal with him anymore. I'm getting rid of him. Either I, I put him in, in in um some foster home, or you uh, take him." It's dis disgusting. Listen, folks, if you're not yet subscribed to Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace, we encourage you to please hit that little subscribe button down below. It's free. It costs you nothing to subscribe. So this way you'll get all things Duty Ron and Ed Wallace when we go live or upload more videos. In 2024, we plan to do more interviews and more uploads. Um, Anthony, I, I, I wanted to keep this to an hour, and we're just at the hour. Do you mind if I ask the chat if they have any questions as it pertains to her care and custody? Um, so if you have a question for Anthony, just put hashtag Anthony, hashtag Ed, hashtag duty Ron, and let's scan the chat while we're scanning the chat. I want to just say thank you to the super chatters and people who sent highlighted messages in, uh, thank you. Um, G one R, uh, I can't see the rest of that. That's uh, veteran. That's veteran. Thank you. So small, the, the, the writing here. Thank you for becoming a channel mark member, Becky L member for 17 months she said i think she won't last unless she's under protection we covered that um you know I, I, we don't think she's going to be in protection uh db became a member thank you for becoming a channel member sister carol ann clark gifted five memberships thank you pierre you became wow. a new member and that covers all the, the highlighted messages anthony will she have to cut her hair and i believe that they make you be like trim the hair right or, or is that not something? well that 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 may not I, I mean it depends on the uh i guess the policy of the state we don't always uh cut uh inmates hair we we have ways to check the hair for contraband i know that uh even if you have muslim she inmates, could opt to it she could opt to do it right yeah. we saw uh we saw um who was that um over in south carolina we we saw um why is his name slipping from me um Murdoch, Murdoch, remember Murdoch? He he yeah. did cut his hair all the way down, and you were like, oh, that's "Well, weird. they may, they may." You know what's funny when we think about that? Or used like someone could pull her with those pigtails. They they may do it again. I don't know. We don't really do that, but they may do it for initial placement because of life, whatever. They may just. But to be honest with you, way rights are right now, uh, I, I don't see that being likely. But you yeah. never know. I didn't that's dependent on the state. Uh, do they have a hair salon in the in the joint? Yeah, here's the funny thing. So me and me and Duty Ron were talking about this before. Um, female facilities uh, for a long time have lacked a lot of um, vocational skill training. Uh, most of them were being trained like uh, or rehabilitated towards Susie homemakers. And they actually started changing that recently where they started to get more um, vocational skills. So like we talked about the facility kind of being in bad shape. Well, a lot of prisons and jails are maintained by inmate maintenance workers. Right. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get female maintenance workers. So those facilities used to have to vendor out and it costs more money. But since I've been involved in the prison system, so back since 2002, when I worked with females, we had beauty salons and it's funny, um, part the of their training, fun. Well, no, not, none of that. Just more towards the hair and stuff. But right. they also, in some facilities, they also, um, with, with the instructor, of course, which would be a civilian or maybe a volunteer, depending on how it works, uh, custody or, or staff can get their hair done. Interesting. Yeah, in some facilities. What about visitors? That was my question that I had written down. When, if and when does that happen? Will she now be able to get visitors in, in while she's in? She's got a life sentence, right? She's going to yeah. be sentenced. She hasn't been sentenced yet, but I anticipate that she's going to be in for the rest of her life with no chance of parole times two. Yeah, so once, you, once she gets into the state, uh, there'll be an orientation process, which is usually done why they're in reception, but she could bypass the reception, but you still have to have an orientation process. And that kind of lets the inmate know the rules and guidelines of the facility. They should be given a handbook of, of how the facility operates. And then uh, it will be requested at that time because you'll have the different programs there. You'll have social services there. They'll request for the emergency contacts. They'll request for uh, her to update a card on her visit list and telephone yep. card. And then that will be the people she's able to have contact with. Excellent. Um, sh uh, Amy says, where are Shonda's parents? Well, we know that somebody flew up from Florida uh, and they said a stepmom. Uh, we know that um, Paul talked about grandma. 
which he she lived local. It was a car drive. So grandma could be either Shonda's mom or could be um, the biological father's mom. We don't know. I don't know much about him. I didn't try to track any of them down, but that's as much as we know about the family. Um, Deco Paint and T asked, okay, what do we got? Naomi. Barrettes. Um, I'm, so in my experience that, that wasn't, um, let me think, Barrettes, Barrettes are, are those the, um, what are Barrettes? Are those the little like rubber band type things that go in the, uh, individual's hair? I What's thought they Barrettes? were plas like plastic or metal or clips. I have no all idea. Right, so um, they're not, they're not. I don't have any hair, so I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, it all, I, I, let's just do it this way. Maybe I can answer it this way. There are certain items that are uh, gender affirming uh, that you can't deny an individual because obviously it, it kind of connects to their gender. Um, but if they feel it's a safety concern, they will deny it. So that would really be depending on what I would believe should be the person's status, the likelihood they can you know, harm themselves with the item. Uh, but if you were an inmate that was in a least restrictive area, they may you know, permit it, but the higher level, they may not be given the same as those that are in um, least restriction. Uh, so I don't know. That could be depending on the facility. I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, uh, I've seen it both ways. I've seen facilities that don't allow things for the hair at all. Uh, but then I, I'm thinking of, of when the women go out for a visit to see a loved one, they get all dolled up, they put their makeup on and they got their hair up and it's, uh, yeah, it's it's got ties and everything in it. So I guess it all really matters on what the facility deems to be a uh, contraband or not. I don't think we've seen the last of uh, Shonda uh, Vander Ark. I think we'll see interviews. I think she'll do jailhouse interviews once she's sentenced. Uh, there'll be plenty of reporters that want to get in there and get a hold of her and hear what she has to say. But yeah. Deco Paint and T says, hashtag Anthony, what determines whether an inmate gets a single cell or shares one? Which one is All likely right. for Shonda? Uh, good question. Thank you, Deco. Yeah. That's a great question. So let's, there are a couple of ways to look at that. So one thing is you have the level of custody of the inmate. Uh, so usually when you have an inmate that's got a lot of time, like a double life sentence, um, you're, you're probably not going to house them with anybody. Uh, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. But for the most part, their sentence will determine uh, if they can house with somebody or not. But uh, with that said, you also have mental health that may decide that this person is so much of a threat uh, that they can't house with anybody or that sometimes they uh, are uh, prone to self-injurious behaviors that we want to have have them next to a cellmate. We're not expecting the cellmate to do anything to stop it, but usually when you have someone else, else in the cell, it's less likely to occur. So mental health can also make the decision. Uh, if there's something medical, I have seen inmates that are heavy snorers and uh, that turns into uh, fist fights late at night, right? So medical may also uh, make a determination that due to the person's medical condition, uh, we may prefer them to be in a single cell. But there's so many circumstances that can warrant a single cell. But I would say for her case here, what's going to predominantly give her that single cell is the double life sentence. Bingo. Uh, Anthony, they're they're attacking. The questions are all at you, not attacking, but they're coming at you because you, you're the correction expert. Uh, will she be able to contact Paul? That's her son who's going to be in another facility. So so this is a unique situation because they're considered co-defendants. So sometimes when people are considered co-defendants, are they, uh, they co-defendants, Ed? No. Two oh, seven. I didn't know. I thought they were because they're part of the same case, yeah. aren't they? They're part of the same case, but uh, separate deals. Trial. Separate. Uh, she had a separate trial. He had a separate trial. Separate lawyers. Yeah, he testified against her for the state. So All right, he didn't so have then, a trial. He pled guilty. So then, what's going to have to, I guess, in this case here, usually what they do here is that one is when you have an inmate right into another inmate, and let's just say that there's no legal conflict behind it all. So let's just put that out there as a general assumption where the where the decision will be made up to the administrators of both facilities. Usually they're the ones that will have to sign off on it. So what happens here, the request would go through to administration or the classification, wherever they work at the facility, but there would be probably be a request from the facility that of the person wanting to make the request. And then what happens here is if there's no uh, concerns from the receiving facility, uh, then you could facilitate the phone call, but the phone call will be a monitored phone call. 
It's right. not a private phone call. It's a monitored phone call. So it would be done probably in a very controlled fashion. Uh, I, I've seen it done where uh, it's done uh, where social services is around and they they stay connected with someone from custody while the phone call is made, but usually be a controlled phone call. They're not going to be able to call each other directly. Interesting. Well, they both have to agree to it. I mean, if Paul says, well, yeah, that's the, yeah. Anymore. Contact right. and if the judge yeah. orders at sentencing, you 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 can no longer have any contact with your son. As that's the time it, game over. On. As the time yeah, goes yeah, on, might that's change, but I I would anticipate that Paul wouldn't want any contact with her as it stands right now. But as the years go on, it might change. You never know. Um, so a lot of people are asking about Paul and what you know what his diagnosis is. He was asked um, by the jury. They, Ed, you and I were scratching our heads. We've never seen this before. The yeah. jury sent on a little piece of paper a message to the judge. And the judge asked Paul at the end of his testimony these questions. For, by a show of hands in the chat, how many of you guys have seen this? Just say yes if you've seen this. Put, put no if you haven't seen this. But the actual jurors wrote down their questions about Paul's mental health and his status. And they wrote yeah. them down. And they handed now this stuff. Yeah. This is not deliberations. They weren't uh, deliberating on the oh. case and then wrote a question out to the judge. This is actually during the trial. You know, yeah. He was testifying and they wrote a note, gave it to the bailiff. Bailiff gave it to the judge and he asked the question. They, the they had a sidebar about it here. This is, you know, let me just set this up. I've, I've never seen that. I've never seen the jury be able to ask questions. Never seen it myself. So I'm going to let it play. It's just it adds a little bit of Ferguson, extra. Ferguson, uh, this is kind of a compound question, so I'm going to ask it. Uh, okay. Mr. Ferguson, do you have any special needs? Do you have any special I needs? I am diagnosed as ADHD, reactive attachment disorder, and sensory processing disorder, as well as I was taking medication for anxiety and depression. Uh, same, similar vein, it might be the same exact answer. Do you have any learning disabilities? Um, I'm not sure if any of those count as learning disabilities, but I suppose, I, don't want to you off. Go ahead. I suppose reactive attachment disorder can make certain things hard. Okay. Yeah, I think the jury wanted to ask these questions to see if he was competent to actually answer these questions. Like, um, I, I feel like they they felt the same way we felt watching this and seeing him give his testimony that he just wasn't right. Right? Am I wrong on that? Yeah, yeah. But he, go on. I mean, he still got one more question, right? Yep. And uh, well, let me let me follow up with that. This is not the jury question, but do you? Has anyone told you? Well. Strike that. Do you have autism? This is the other question. Do you have autism? To your he didn't know how to ask. Um, not to my knowledge. Not that I've been diagnosed with. And do you have any other uh, emotional issues um, that you're aware of? Anger issues. I never have been good at controlling my anger. Never was truly taught well. Never was truly taught well. Uh, you know, you sh he should have uh, asked who diagnosed you, when was that diagnosis, well, and what kind gonna, of treatment? I was going to say, Ed, so it's funny because I've actually, um, we deal a lot with post-conviction release, and um, it's tough to ask for the diagnosis without violating HIPAA, so they have to prove that that's relevant uh, to the case. So usually that's going to benefit him. So most of the time people don't go against it uh, because that's only going to help me. Uh, if I decide to, uh, you know, uh, not uh, be not found whatever guilty because of my mental competency. But but to be honest with you, I, I think uh, I think these questions could have been maybe a little bit more of sympathy to, towards him uh, mm -hmm. from the jury to see exactly, uh, you know, if, if this guy's 100 percent there. I, I agree. I, I, but I think more so is if they could believe his testimony. Like, in other words, they were, I think they were asking that to, That's a good point. to yeah, to, to kind of like say to themselves, how much do we weigh his testimony that we need to know what his mental status is and what he, what he has or doesn't have? Cause they didn't have any of that information. It's quite apparent that they didn't know. And like Ed said, the judge should have followed that up or that should have been 
done by the prosecutor. Like, hey, my, uh, the, our, you know, our, ex, our witness, not expert, our witness who's testifying for the state, um, who happens to be someone who's also going to have a, a separate jury, uh, a separate trial, is um, has the following ailments, has the following me- uh, mental health issues. But he didn't do that. So Steve sent the super right. chat as in Michigan, the jury gets to ask questions. So I guess this is, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've never seen this in New York. That's for sure. I've seen it in civil trials, but I haven't seen it in never criminal trials. Never in a criminal. Thank and you. And you know, the- you, you know what's funny, did you, I've only, in my career, I've only seen a handful of sociopaths. I mean, granted, I know people think that we're in a prison and we're surrounded by sociopaths and psychopaths, but that's not, right. that's not true. There's only a handful, but I would definitely say from, uh, the mother's demeanor here, she would probably, and, and, and the crime of torture to her child, she right. would definitely be considered a sociopath of someone who does not have empathy. So Paul held the job as a dishwasher at Applebee's, and he talks about it in his testimony at the trial here. So thank you for that quick question, Kristen. Kristen, I appreciate that. Uh, Jennifer Johnson says, I'm new to you guys, and I'm so blessed to be here. Thank you. Thankful for your honest and professional analysis of situations. God bless you for your service and dedication to the truth. Well, thank you so much for that. We we so appreciate your kind uh, words and also your support here on Crime Time with Duty Ron. It means a lot to Ed and myself. We put a lot of hard work into this, um, and and we love to have uh, folks like yourself that are going to come in and ask tough questions. Um, and hope right. you think about subscribing. Yeah, please consider subscribing. <laughs> thank you, Ed. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to take it off the screen. I thought it was important that we play that. Did you see, Ed? A lot of people didn't hear him say that because that happened at the very, very end. Yeah. Of four hours and 16 minutes worth of uh, worth of trial testimony. So uh, he wasn't necessarily on the, on the stand for four hours and 16 minutes, but that was the whole day. So maybe some people at the end of this just dropped off while it was live and didn't actually catch that. Mm-hmm. I personally didn't catch it until I watched it two times over. And then I I saw it and I was like, oh, oh wow. I'm just I'm just curious about the the health care for these children at all. I mean, it doesn't appear they've been to doctors. It doesn't appear as they've been to dentists. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um. So if he if he was getting some kind of mental health uh, treatment, if he had these diagnoses, um, and I'm sure the other uh, Timothy had these uh, diagnoses as well. And where were their meds? Uh, you know. It didn't, it didn't like, none of this is jiving to me because they didn't seem, she didn't take them to the doctors. She didn't, she right. didn't, they don't seem to have the medications that you would have for, uh, um, for Timothy's needs. Uh, I don't believe that he had any medications there for, yeah. And she said, oh, at one point she said, I couldn't take him to the doctor or I couldn't take him to register them for school. Cause I wasn't supposed to have them. Cause I wasn't supposed to have them. That's right. She knew it was illegal. What, so she was, what's admitting, the, no. she was admitting that she was doing something illegal. And the funny thing is, guys, is once they get locked up, it could be the first time they're ever given a mental health evaluation in which mental health would give a diagnosis at that point. So if he was already in jail or right. state, whatever it meant, they could probably be referring to the right. um, the mental health professional who works at the jail for a diagnosis. Well, they're going to be, first of all, they have to have that done now before they go to sentencing because the yeah. judge is going to get a report from, um, yeah, right. you sure. know, and so that will be in there. Right. You know, but he does put on the record that he ha- wasn't uh, ever diagnosed with it. That doesn't mean that now somebody could interview him, Paul, and say, oh, you have this, this, and this. So th- this could also happen in between the 29th and now all this time. Uh, Did she have her own health care? Did the mom have her own health care? Because she testified that she wouldn't bring him the health care because she did- the father didn't give the health care information for Timothy. So right. she was going to use the father's health care. Okay. And, and Tim, and, from out of state. And Paul went to school. He graduated from high school, local high school. He, yeah, I saw it on his Facebook. Uh, let's show uh, Anthony's YouTube channel, Tier Talk. Oh, yeah, there he's it is. He's at 24 7. Let's get him to 25K before the end of the year. Everybody yeah. go over there and subscribe. Look, I'm subscribed all. <laughs> I just no. saw that. Yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, I was subscribed, but it said personalized. I checked it to all. So now I get Oh, him. that explains it. Yes. No, no, but look, you have to so so some people could get no notifications, personalized, or all. This is what you want. All. 
Boom. Okay, that's good to know. Well, YouTube does that. Sometimes you can sub subscribe and check all, and then you go and you check, and then it's back to personalized. I don't know. If I, I want to. I want to mention something too, uh, because I see a lot of people mentioning stuff about manipulation. So I, I want to mention just real quick. Uh, obviously, I, I do have a book on inmate manipulation. It's available, but manipulation uh, is usually you're able to do it because you don't have empathy. You know, you're able to manipulate somebody because you really don't feel uh, or you really don't care about how they feel uh, the end result would be. So, I mean, if she's an expert manipulator, uh, that could also lean into someone being a sociopathic because manipulation, the end result of manipulation is it's all about me and, and, and nothing about you. So I'm very curious to see. Um, it, I know a lot of people think that she could be an expert manipulator, but I'd love to see whatever that skill was that she had on the outside. I'd love to see how it translates behind the wall, but I think it's going to translate very well with the skill that she's bringing in the the legal thing. She's going to find uh, gonna use that to her advantage. She's going to use that to her yeah. advantage. No question. She's like, going to have a lot of commissary money. People are calling yeah. her. <laughs> Head knows. People, so people are calling her a manipulator because they watched her her performance in court. So they're going to just all of a sudden, everyone, just human beings, are just going to assume that she's going to carry that into what, this facility. But this facility is going to be hardcore, something that she's not used to. She's not used to jail life and, and prison life. Um, albeit she's been in a local jail for quite a bit of time, but she's not an expert when it comes to this, this type of it, – it's a big difference between jail and prison. These are people who are there for the long haul. Some of them have nothing to lose, and some of them, like herself, who have. We know that she's going to get um, at least one uh, life without parole um, sentence, and it may be. I, I hope they throw the book at her, and she gets two life sentences mm -hmm. without parole. Um, but when she goes there, she, there's not going to be anything that's going to be in her way to, to um, you know, to to stop her from doing something silly or having somebody do something silly to her as well because what and it's funny what do they got to lose they got and it's funny because is Ed from New York too? It, yeah it, it, it's, it, it, it's gonna be the like she's gonna she's gonna play somehow the victim card and seek sympathy or empathy when she was never able to give it out but that's what they'll wind up doing they'll play the right. opposite end of it all so when she gets locked in. Uh, you know, she, she's probably going to go right up to the bat where it's like, oh, well, you know what? I was wrong. I was a victim. And now this is what happened. Some people will believe that. Mm, yeah. You know, even if it, even if it doesn't relate to the current story, she create a backstory that it, I know it's a shame what happened to Timothy, but she could make it a victim story where, you know, it was the backstory, what happened to her that made her desensitized to uh, uh, what what she was doing to uh, this poor young kid, and people will buy into that because the backstory matters, and it's yeah. like, oh well, yeah. Absolutely. Everybody in prison is innocent, of course. <laughs> of course. I didn't do it. I, I'm, I didn't do it, and I, I shouldn't have gotten sentenced. I, I, you guys locked up innocent people all the time, right? Yeah, yeah, you told me, right? Sure. right? It's all a bunch of hogwash. Hold on. Oh hell no! Pardon my French. <laughs> um, let's thank our moderators and our replay viewers and everyone who has been civil in the chat. I know there's some people, this is a tough case to cover. There's a lot of emotions that run high and, you know, people just have to understand, you know, listen, we all have our opinions and feelings and thoughts here. The end of the day, um, you know, we're, we're giving you the perspective from experts and Anthony is an uh, corrections expert. So the things you heard him talk about here tonight, albeit it might not be something that you want to hear. This is how it goes. And this is the ways that uh, prisons and jails are run. Uh, and I want to thank Anthony for taking an hour and 30 of his time tonight, hanging out here with us. Make sure you guys go over and subscribe. His book is available on my website as well um so in, there it is inmate decoded manipulation decoded and he's got a whole bunch of other ones so everything that you see from anthony yeah look look he's got them all wow uh and and i want to say thank you to ed for taking out the time he's army training he's doing army training uh, this week army training sir sir and so ed is always willing and, and ready and able to come up Tomorrow we're gonna take the take a break, but then Thursday, one one two two King Road gets demolished at seven a.m. Oh, what is that? I, I can't even believe that they they haven't stopped that. No injunctions, no court action. But maybe we may get something at the last minute. Ed, you want to maybe talk a little bit about your thoughts two days from now? One one two two. It's not. There's no evidence inside there. 
it's the crime scene location is what it is right right it, it, i don't get it i'm sorry uh you know i think i like to think that i'm a reasonable person right i just don't get this okay keep it there until after the trial okay yeah. uh, listen for you know i heard people say oh it's you know it's causing psychological damage to the uh, school and it's causing psychological damage to the students that live nearby are you kidding me are you kidding me all right for the initial part yes right for the initial part uh, for the shock and the awe of what happened there okay but you think those frats and those sorority houses that live right nearby there walking distance stop partying after no. this incident occurred okay oh hell no okay i mean please it's better to keep it and not need it than need it and not have it. What, what is the harm? What is the harm? Now they, they um, you know, the judge said, okay, well, you know, the prosecution um, asked the judge for a certain trial date in uh, summer of next year. Right. Okay. Uh, I mean. Why I, would the prosecutor go back there too, Ed? I, I don't want to make this another a du a dueling show because we could do a whole other show on that. But uh, Bill Thompson went back to 1122 King Road oh, right before Christmas. Right. Just well, to, how just, is he doing there now? Okay. Maybe he wanted another look there to see if maybe he's now going to object to the judge uh, and ask the judge to step in and stop the school from tearing it down. Yeah, well, he's dragging his feet. He should be doing that like <laughs> right now. <laughs> it should be done. Uh, all right, guys and girls, I want to thank you for joining. Make sure you hit the subscribe and give us the thumbs up. Ed and I appreciate the cups of coffee. Katina bought us five cups of coffee on uh, Christmas Eve. I was like, I got to drink five cups of coffee. I'm going to be up till four in the morning. <laughs> so thank you, Katina, for always supporting Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed and all of you guys who do and go that extra mile, becoming channel members. It's all, you know, you don't, it's not necessary, but you guys do it and we appreciate it. Uh, thank you for watching the videos in full and giving the thumbs up. It helps with the algorithm uh, and the moderators. Uh, you guys are second to none. You ladies, gents, I appreciate Ed and I appreciate so much the hard work that you guys do. Uh, I see Diane B., my neighbor across the street, she, she changed her profile picture to me and her. Isn't that cute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> she, she, she picked the worst picture of me. And and she and she put that as her as her highlight picture. Uh, what the hell is it? I can't find it. She got your attention. She did get my attention. I saw it like uh, two two live streams ago. Yeah, there she is. Oh, Me there and it is. We're, okay. we're, we're Be nice. Be and nice to Diane. I love Diane. She's the That's best. That's right. She won't snow blow your sidewalk. Yeah, she'll 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 blow the snow right up off the street onto my house. So <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I noticed it two live streams ago. Hold on. She's saying you finally noticed it. No, I noticed it two live streams ago. I just didn't want to give her the attention. Tonight, uh, I'm going to give her the attention. That's like a little Christmas gift. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> good job. That thing's been there for about a week or so. Um, I just didn't want to give her, you know, you, you give the attention, then they'll do it more. All of a sudden, she'll start doing billboards, you know? Hey, did uh, everybody see Ron's Tesla doing the Christmas lights and music? I saw that. I saw it. <laughs> You, you that was the video that? you just that was the video you, yeah, yeah. You that was the video that? you posted. Hold I got to tell I got to call uh e Elon up and say, "Yeah, you have too much time on your hands if your car's doing Christmas lights and music." Yeah, what the hell? That man? was the 2024 Expo or something I saw you uh I saw that video. Um it was it was the the they did a um they did an update over the air and um and I got it on Christmas Eve, so I went outside and I I played it. So let's do it. Oh, what the hell? It's like it's got a light package now. You can go run up and down the street. With fire. It's loud. Neighbors love me. Can you drive with that on? No. Uh.
Okay, so you don't need to decorate your house anymore. Just leave the car in the driveway and and turn on the lights and music. Back hatch. Look at the back hatch is opening. The back hatch. What? Why is that? It just opens up and it does like a little thing to the music. It goes up and then stops and goes back down. The, the windows are going up and down. Your, your car is possessed. Tesla. Oh my god. And this is the part when it drives back to the dealer. Watch this. <laughs> I can recall, you know, if, if Janine and I, if we're out to dinner and it starts to rain, instead of me running to the car and getting the car and pulling it up, I could just recall it from the app and it comes right straight to me. Wow. Anyways, like a drone. Some cool stuff. Yes. Anyways, thank you all for being here. Hope you had a Merry Christmas and a happy, healthy new year. Um, that's that's what this is all about. Before we know it, the weekends will, the weekend will be here and we'll be uh, doing the ball drop. I want to have another video because there's a there's a New Year's Eve uh, video, uh, the actual light show. So New Year's Eve, I'm going to go out, get the Tesla, turn it on, and do some more stuff on that. Is it going to play Old Lang Syne? Yeah, Ed, why you got to give it away? Come on, man. Oh, I, How did you know? Oh, it's <laughs> what we play here. You know, but you know, us Scottish people play that song all the time. It's not just for New Year's. There you go. <laughs> yeah, it's played on a regular. Uh -huh. All right, on behalf of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace, we want to wish you, again, uh, Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, um, and sending strength, prayers, and positive vibes to everybody that's affected by crime out there across the globe. Anthony, I want to thank you for being here as well. You guys are you're a great friend of this channel, and I appreciate you. Uh, I thank you uh, for your expertise and for the work that you do behind the wall. The men and women in corrections, it's a thankless job, and it's a dangerous job. So we thank you for all the hard work that all of our corrections brothers and sisters do day in and day out. Thank you. All right, guys. Ed, I know you got some. I can't end this without Ed's last words. All right, folks. Stay safe. Stay prepared and watch your six. All right. Happy New Year. Peace and love, guys. Take care. Thanks, Ant.